Hello. So welcome to this talk with Gemini Brit, which I'm super excited to be doing. And uh, Gemini, who many of you might already know, is calls himself a, an astrologer, a storyteller, and a guide. And I first worked with Gemini, um, <clears throat> well, I got introduced to him through Ari Moshe Wolf, my astrology teacher, main one, and then took some of Gemini's classes with uh, Astrology Hub, and then connected with him one-on-one -on -one last summer and had some really wonderful conversations and learning with him. And Gemini does lots of things, but he's particularly passionate about um, the, the stars themselves and the the sacred geometry, which is part of what we're going to be talking about today, and the the astronomy of astrology, among many other things. So uh, today we're going to be speaking on what he's calling curves and lines, living both sides of the grand design. I'm really excited. Thank you for being here. My tree, Martha. Thanks for having me. How in the heavens are you? Good. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah, I'm excited for this. It's a uh, fascinating territory. Um, what's the overall title of the symposium? Uh, it is called Rebecoming the One and uh, Healing, Healing, Gender, Sexuality, Love, and our, or, no, hearing, sorry, Healing Our Relationship to Gender, Sexuality, Love, and Life Itself. Beautiful, which seems like it's part of what Earth is about. Yes. Um, and things are like really shifting in that regard lately. It's been interesting for me on my own astrological path um, because I began my studies at the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, um, which has a lot of use of the terms feminine and masculine. And Venus, they kind of see as the representative for the divine feminine and Mars for the sacred masculine. Um, and, you know, I was working within that his paradigm as a counseling astrologer for some time and in presentations. And there was a particular festival where I was offering a um, transmission that's called the 13th flower. And it's about the Venus synodic cycle and how these archetypes change over time. Like we're in a really big time in that regard, because one of the star points is of the Venus cycle is currently moving from Scorpio to Libra. They retrograde slowly through the signs. Um, and then eventually we'll have an Aries point go to Pisces. And there's these things, interesting shifts from signs traditionally associated with Mars to signs that have Venus associations, right? Um, and so I was rapping about that. that. That kind of first came in when I was invited to do a talk on Friday the 13th in Salem, Oregon. And I was like, that's close enough to Salem, Massachusetts. And I'm going to dive deep into that. And my friend Sienna Dawn created this amazing like goddess totem. That's like from the burning times to like the emergence of like the warrior to the, the crown on the queen's head and these five archetypes of this Venus thing. And it's a cool talk, right? But anyway, I was doing that at this festival and I was like inviting folks to it. And I invited a young one to the talk and they're like, what? I was like, yeah, it's about the, the archetypal ascent of the global guidus, right? which is what I kind of refer to as this divine feminine being. And, she, and this kid was just like, oh, like, what? Like, are you like you relic? You know, like, you can't say divine feminine. Um, interestingly, at that same festival, a now dear friend and cohort who I just met this day, and we were at dinner, and I was saying some things that were really regurgitations of teachings I had received um, around patriarchy. And she goes, stop bashing the mask, man. Right? Like masculine bashing. So it was like really interesting on this day. I should look into the transits for me that day. I was, I was asked to kind of really drop into, hey, what am I teaching uh, and how am I using this idea of the sacred and feminine and sacred masculine astrologically? And what happens when that goes away? Because I was also then 
um, honored with the opportunity to sit with many um, clients who weren't identifying as masculine or feminine mm -hmm. or who were attracted to both genders or all genders or whatever right and this like the way that the spectrum has been opening up and shifting has been super fascinating to see right like challenging as well from folks who i think are looking in i guess i'd say from the outside but that's very untrue right we're asked to find our connection to this evolving conversation by looking within really yeah. But then also like, oh, how do I use these techniques I was taught, right? If Venus is the feminine and Mars is the masculine, like what, how, do, how does that apply anymore? And it actually, in a way, invited me to release some of that identification or association and go back to like earlier statements about what Venus and Mars are from the astrological tradition. So much of my own path has been taking me back to ancient astrology mm -hmm. and um, a huge part of my path as you mentioned kind of within the title of this chat or presentation if you will has brought me into sacred geometry as a really principal study of the astrological mysteries um, and i had no idea <laughs> but that happened for me in a medicine ceremony one night uh, where I was sitting in this beautiful building that's a perfect regular hexagon. And I was so deep at that time in the study of the Venus pentacle. Um, and so I was like, oh, I wish this was a pentagram, like this thing should be astrological, right? And then that night it was basically like, dude, you are literally sitting within a zodiac and it's all about sixes and twelves and uh, you need to stop watching those like sacred geometry cartoons and get a compass in your hand. Right. Um, and then that's an amazing study. Like traditionally you really wouldn't study astrology without studying astronomy and you wouldn't study astronomy without studying geometry and musical harmony as I'll show a slide to speak mm -hmm. to these sacred sciences known as the quadrivium. Um, and there's a statement that's pretty heavy that when you put the compass in your hand, you become God. It's like, wow. what? <laughs> right? But which is obviously like lightning from the sky blasphemy for many folks, um, but probably not those who are tuning into this jam. And I think it's really about it's a statement regarding how in geometry, the compass and the rule, like you're studying creation through the act of creating. And I think that actually applies to all things here in the incarnated realms. Mm -hmm. Anything come alive for you in that? Oh, well, lots of things. What I'm curious to hear more about is when you were thinking about what to speak to for the symposium, can, do you want to say more about why sacred geometry? Like, why did that click in for you? What, what, What's alive for you in that? Well, it's just so deep in my own study and in, in this image of like, okay, the not to which is kind of an Eastern way to present all polarities, including up and down and in and out, um, a yin and yang, you know, like, but also because what I really wanted to share was this um, journey into what the F happened here that has basically at the very root of a collective wound festered into patriarchy and how like the way that we will come out of that is not through attacking this image of the false king, but rather loving this image of the unnurtured child. Um, but sitting with that last night, I was like, yeah, that story just gets really heavy <laughs> because it's about like the almost total annihilation of our species through a cataclysm and what resulted thereafter and it's a brilliant place to go to have some more understanding about this division that we're you know called to heal i think that's part of incarnation but i also thought that this geometrical dance um, with the not to would be maybe more informative and open more of an opportunity for um, listeners to engage with the material in their own wisdom stream. Yeah, well, I would 
personally love to hear whatever is calling to you. And um, uh, in the, the talk that I did with Ari Moshe for the symposium, we talked about Saturn. So it seems very related to what you're saying there. And, and to sum it up in my own words, <laughs> his wisdom around <clears throat> Saturn was essentially um, that there is a conditioned conditioning. There's a conditioned way of thinking of the conditioning of Saturn. And then there is a deconditioned way, right? And, and in his, again, I'm paraphrasing him and I could be getting this wrong, but my sense, my takeaway from what he was sharing was um, that if, if, if Saturn were deconditioned and we were just with the essence of that energetic, it's actually a yin and a very gentle sense of uh, structures, you know, it's an energy that <clears throat> relates to the structures that hold us, that we need to, to function in this world. And it's not actually a patriarch, what we think of, what we associate with the patriarchy as being harsh and um, punitive or all of that, right? Yeah, or, but see, there's also a statement in that, that the masculine is harsh and punitive, right? I know you're not right. saying that, but yeah. it's also built into that contemplation. And yeah, I mean, so the the comet cataclysm and what resulted in a division of the species is a very different story. But, you know, I think that's interesting around Saturn. And it's, you know, one of the adventures of traditional astrology is releasing the idea that, that like Uranus is the ruler of Aquarius. I don't love that word ruler, by the way, actually in the shamanic astrology mystery school, they don't do dispositorship, which mm -hmm. folks are more familiar with in the term rulership. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, they didn't say ruler, they said domicile lord or lady right using those very old terms but it's like the landlord it's like that i own this house right and i mean i think a gift of traditional astrology is every planet has two homes and one is in a sign of either earth or water that many would call feminine i prefer to say nocturnal um, and then the other is in a diurnal sign so contemplating the difference between Capricorn and Saturn and Aquarius Saturn is an opportunity when we tune into the traditional symmetry that's kind of lost in modern times. Like I associate with Aquarius in much more of a Uranian way because, you know, that's how it was first transmitted to me in that kind of Uranian necess necessity of, well, like, revolution <laughs> and innovation typically through rebelling against the rules but it's not always that right and this is the way that i look at the signs one when it's kind of um doing things quote unquote right will lead to the next and it's more of a cyclical image or when it's doing something quote unquote wrong according to the next signs ideal um, then the next sign will be a reaction, a necessary reaction to that sign. So like a genius example is Pisces. You know, when we ask Pisces, just as the archetype, I'm not talking about Pisces sun sign people. Um, you know, what are we doing here? It's like, oh, why are we here? To get back to source. It's like, okay, but why would you come? Do you know what I mean? Um, but that, that whole idea of it, it's all about the one. It's all about kind of releasing you know, ego consciousness or the me, so I can return to oneness. Um, the necessary reaction to that is no, 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 it's about the I, right? And that's like the Aries mm -hmm. walk, right? So, but there's another space where Pisces, which I think demands kind of our intuitive understanding and in, in, like feeling the room <laughs> will allow Aries to do its thing at the right time, right? And so that we could start all the way anywhere. But if I start at Capricorn, the way that I like to look at that is you can't have a game without rules. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, you know, incarnation <laughs> applies here, right? So if the rules of the game are cool, you know, like if you really dig checkers, then Aquarius is here to kind of innovate within that rule set and shift the game. But it might say like, hey, checkers is lame. And what about chess? Right. And then we have to develop all these things that end up leading to like the rules of this new game, like the pawn moves one or two out the gate and the bishop stays on its own square color and all that, you know. Um, 
and then again you can say hey like i that's like super restrictive like i don't want all your rules you know i want like freedom and then you have to rebel against that or you can say wow that's a really cool game and it opens up these like unlimited potentials and then the aquarius saturn will be like redefining restructuring re, you know like innovating within that rule set yeah right. and, but that. innovation is always seen in a sense well, i mean to finish that chess thing you know there's like chess openings that are named after like famous chessers like i'm not in that camp so i can't really state names but i think you're aware of that right we have the basic rules of chess but then if you're like a chess cat there's this whole other set of things that everybody knows that like famous people brought into the game and that for me is kind of like that Aquarian contribution when they dig the way the Capricorn rule set works right but either way when you bring innovation against tradition it really feels like something against tradition even if it's to preserve a tradition for the current which I think might speak to a bit of what you're after here right because it's like oh how can we take some of these ancient like alchemical recipes and not completely like just destroy them because they do not work within this like adventure of releasing duality because there's so much of that in the alchemical mix that really it's about two three and four um but you know like how can i actually kind of innovate within the realms of that tradition to preserve the tradition, but let it expand as our consciousness evolves or whatever it may be. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Either way, you're going to be seen as a revolutionary, right? To kind of the old guard. So the Pisces bit, first of all, it's like, don't revolt against anything because it is you. We are one. <laughs> you are me. You know what I mean? And the other bit is like, okay, well, if you are going to innovate, like do it when people are smiling already, like bring that thing on a good day. Right. And it really opens up the necessity of intuition, which I think gives Aries and that kind of initiation of a new scene um, or of an individuation, um, the right timing to go forth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so there's 17 minutes before we get to the topic <laughs> at hand, but it all completely applies, right? And so the other reason why I thought curves and lines is because I can show a bunch of pretty pictures that I've recently created for my school of Earth Astrology, um, where this year, this is the first year of the school, it's called the Golden Year, and we're following the sun through the signs, which is fun for me because I've been anti-sun sign astrology is the wrong way to say it but you know i have a lot of resistance to you know just like the sun sign version of the thing and that a lot of that also however kind of came from my first learnings in astrology and i've come more and more to honor the truth that like the sun is the only one in the chart that will tell me what time of year and what time of day it is by sign and by house respectively and then i can only see the moon because she's reflecting sunlight to my eyes and that's true of all of these planetas are wandering really mirrors of our solar system and such and so every month we're doing a um archetypal transmission um, mm -hmm. which is cool because we all reach these archetypes in different ways and i really do value this about Daniel Jamario at the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, like he really keeps, I'll, I'll call it the goddess intact in these signs, you know, and it kind of is, is, is remembering like that other side, which, you know, I think is aligned also, um, at least for Capricorn in regards to how, what I'm hearing from you, our emotion is speaking about for Saturn, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also doing like a fundamentalism, calling it astrology class, like, polarity, triplicity, quadruplicity, or, the, or people will know that as like, you know, the polarities, the elements, the modalities, the next one's going to be soul path and moving on and on and on. Um, huh. But then I'm also doing a sacred geometry number magic class each month, and we'll go from the one to 12-ness. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, let me dive in if that feels right, Martha. Totally, go for it. Cool. All right. So the school of astrology, because this is about connecting to 
the heavenly harmonies with our feet on the ground. Um, so let us explore the one, which in a way here is represented by the sun. And uh, in our first little bit of this journey, we'll go there. But also, I want to bring you by the end of this flow to this weird whisper from the Pythagorean tradition, which probably reaches back to Kemet, the land we call Egypt, which is when the one becomes two, then three and four. Right. And so I hear that and it's like, <laughs> what? And how does that apply to astrology, which I think is fun, too? So these four sciences um, were called the quadrivium. And in the mystery traditions, at least in the Western mystery traditions, as it's known, but I think this was really a global thing. This is the gateway to studying what we call astrology. Actually, what we call astrology is really just correspondences, whereas astrology is the rainbow bridge that exists between astronomy and correspondences, where astronomy is like the measurable heavenly happenings, like the rule version of the heavenly happenings or the line, and I'll get more into why I call it that, where correspondence is a little bit more of the curve, it's immeasurable, right? Um, or quantity astronomy and quality correspondences with astrology is the divine science or sacred art that connects the two. Art is the bridge between science and spirit. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, well, astrology herself is certainly a sacred science or a spirit science. Um, the astronomy would be more like science and correspondences more like spirit. Yeah. So we'll see actually in all things that are two, three, <laughs> because there's always a bridge, which is the relationship between the two or the not two. So harmony works like this. It's like maybe easier for us to understand because, you know, I can make a noise um, and that's going to be a different sound for you than it is for anyone else. Right, like the noise is this measurable quantity, it's vibrating the medium, it has periodicity, frequency, amplitude, whatnot, you know. Um, but how does it move you? Does it move you in or move you away? Or, you know what I'm saying? And that's a very personal thing. So sound itself or harmony has, has quantity and quality. Or line and curve or measurable and immeasurable. Right, and harmony is the sacred science that connects those two. Geometry is the same way. But when we look at these words geometry and arithmetic, people tend to have like traumatic remembrances from elementary school or whatever. So I like to kind of qualify these in ways. First of all, astronomy traditionally was known as number in time and space. So if you want to know astronomy and you need to know astronomy to get to the correspondences through astrology, Right. These days, most of us are just letting the lab coat cats do that for us and the software, you know. Um, but if you really want to deepen into a personal embodied Earth astrology experience, like the astronomy is kind of critical. And if it's number and time and space, then the route to knowing this is number and time and number and space, hmm. just harmony and geometry. Right. So harmony is frequency, cycles, rhythm. Right. Geometry is these beautiful shapes. They really are, in a sense, like two sides of one thing, which means they are not two. And at their root is number itself, which was known as arithmetic. But that sounds like one plus one is two. Numbers have quality, too. Right. So how could you add oneness to anything? Hmm. Or you can't get to two-ness by oneness plus oneness because oneness is already everything. So how do we find two? That'll be one of our adventures. But first, I'm just going to kind of add sacreds here <laughs> to like make this a little easier. Geometry and sacred geometry these days sound like very different things, right? Where geometry was those like weird proofs that we had to do in high school. Yep. And sacred geometry is these shapes that kind of invoke a psychedelic experience somehow. 
and transmit deep truth, you know. But in the day, like that's what geometry meant. It's actually both sides of those things. Like there's the quantity and the quality of number and space. And for arithmetic, I prefer to say number magic. Mm. Like I might say numerology, but that has like its own realm. I think it's part of number magic, but really it's about number in nature, right? So is time a human construct? And the answer is not on a planet that spins and orbits because that's a day and a year, right? Hours, minutes, seconds, that's another kind of trip. But if your skin wrinkles, you're probably living on a planet that spins, you know? And I think that I have a hard time with folks who are like, time is just an illusion. It's just a construct because it kind of feels like evading the embodied human experience which is about the down and in and why is not just not just as important as the up and out in fact that might be some like oh if you will patriarchal resonance of avoiding the embodied experience and the body holds the heart you know and the art of the chart starts in the heart mm -hmm. so i'm careful of that yeah Anyway, let's move forward. Um, this is a thing, it's whispered from the Pythagorean tradition of all is number. So time's not a construct and number isn't either. So that's like a really interesting trip. You know, why did we get after number in the first place? I mean, there's a difference between a five petaled flower and one that has six. And they're both intriguing and they're both gateways, you know, but especially if you want to learn the cosmos and track the cycles math starts developing rather quickly if you want to you know use the phases of the moon to determine when you will meet you know fellows from across the way right because back in the day there wasn't a thing you could grab out of your pocket for the time <laughs> yeah and time is told by the sky and cycles within cycles within cycles you know um, and it's one of the great gifts of astrology that allows us Hopefully not to get out of this moment because we want astrology to be a way in. But when we look to the cycles and the rhythms and how they've kind of shown themselves in the past, like this Jupiter-Neptune conjunction that's just happening. And they're like every 13 years, but every 166 in a sign. And I'm finding this like 10,000 year period. You know what I mean? So like that can just get you so far from the moment now. And sometimes astrology is used as a way out. But it can also really help us get in when we understand like how these rhythms are coming together in different ways to really help the help us experience the celestial symphony and the gifts that it offers for our own growth and evolution you know um so number itself is if you're starting to learn number and track these cycles there's this fascinating thing that happens it's like oh well this was here before we were like this is part of the design it's not just some like mental construct you know, this would be maybe an easier pill for some to swallow where a number just does feel like that, like some kind of brain thing, you know, which is all is one. But isn't that a number too? <laughs> no, and it feels to me like this is at the heart of the symposium. Like, what is oneness? So at the very root of the Western mystical tradition is this amazing cryptic <laughs> transmission called the emerald tablet of hermes for anyone who wants to like dive into this by the way um check out the emerald ha tablet of hermes and its many translations um i will just offer a warning that there's a text from like the 70s called the emerald tablets of thought that's a different thing i'm not saying you shouldn't check that out too but the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, depending on translator, typically has these 14 cryptic rubrics. And this would be some showed as the first or the first and the second. This, by the way, is Isaac Newton's translation, who was like far too much of a mystic to be considered Newtonian in the modern parlance of the word. Um, so, tis true without lying, certain and most true. That which is below is like that which is above. And that which is above is like that which is below, to do the miracles of one only thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the astrology realm, we hear this all the time, as above, so below. Um, but they skip as below, so above, 
What does that mean? I will suggest it says we are not only audience members of the Celestial Symphony, we have instruments in our hands and we can jam. And when we come and celebrate and ceremonialize these great conjunctions or whatever it may be, like we allow spirit to see our participation in the thing, you know. But the, for me, the most important bit of this rubric is to do the miracles of one only thing. And it's capitalized for a reason. So, you know, what is one only thing? You and I learned one like this in school, one line and two lines is two and three is three. And, you know, maybe IV gives you four and the V is the five or five is four of these and the slash through them or whatever you want to do to count higher. And we have 10 numbers because 10 fingers and da da da, you know. Um, and it's a cool image for what I call one V or an I. Um, but a much better image for the one mm -hmm. is this circle, which in astrology we call the circle of spirit. And we have these three things that are the circle of spirit, the crescent of soul, and the cross of matter. That are the essential elements for all of the planet glyphs as we draw them today. Mercury, famously the one with all three. And actually at the end of the Emerald Tablets, there's a statement, Hence I am called Hermes Trismegistus, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. Wow. Which I would suggest are circle, crescent, cross, spirit, soul, and matter, or even sun, moon, and earth. And at the very end, it's that which I have said of the operation of the sun is accomplished and ended. So this is really interesting thing where he begins with the miracles of one only thing. And at the end, the operation of the sun is Hermes saying that the sun is the one only thing. Hmm. And I wonder if that's true, like here in this world. So a beautiful image of circle as one versus line is you have in a plane, really a reflection of the sphere which the mysteries knew as the goddess or the heavenly form or the perfect form and alan watts who's one of my favorite teachers asked this question of you know which point on the surface of the sphere is the center of the surface of the sphere there isn't one you know like where is the beginning of this circle now that i drew it with a compass you know, we saw that it started on like what we would identify as the top of this screen. But once it's drawn, you have no idea. You know, there is no beginning point of a circle, which would be a good thing for astrology to remember. There's a reason why zero Aries can be seen as the beginning of the zodiac, like astronomically speaking. But we also want to be able to begin everywhere because that brings us into circular psych cyclical consciousness right so it's a very different like image and circle time versus line time yeah um or even and, similar, like the galaxy being moving more well anyway it's not all circular it's also sort of a spiralish yeah and ellipses and spirals and yeah i mean but even if, if you like look at a coil of spirals like from one edge you're looking at a circle you know but yeah. circles themselves have these two things they have their circumference which in a way is immeasurable like if you want the perimeter of a circle the circumference you need to use this weird thing pi or you either need to like take a string and trace the circle and then stretch it out so you can measure it because you can measure lines but you can't measure curves so we, you know, estimate it using this weird thing, pi, that they call irrational. I prefer to just call it curvy or <laughs> immeasurable or transcendental mm -hmm. because irrational kind of sounds like a bad word. But it's really not in a sense. We want to, as astrologers, have our kind of measurable quantity line side and our immeasurable quality curvy side. And that can be seen as rational and irrational or, you know, technique and intuition. Right. So that's like a huge part of this adventure through the geometries to get to like a higher understanding or a wider understanding of astrology, right, for a more intimate expression of correspondences, I feel. Mm -hmm. So even in this image of the one, we have the two, we have the radii. 
Um, and the circle, we also have that maybe the three, that original point of source. So there's an infinite amount of these radii, and I would suggest I am one, and you are one, and you, and you, and you, and we are really all just rays of the one only light of spirit, right? So eventually, if we get enough of these things, it just becomes that dot, which is like source in the center from which spirit emerges. And it emerges in this way, like in all of these lines, that's us going back to source. And of course, here we see like the glyph that we use in our day and age to depict the sun. So how is the sun the one only thing? I like this image of like, you can kind of fall into the symbol of the circumpunct, right? And it can take you way out as well, <laughs> you know? If we traveled in a spaceship to Vega, right the sun which is a sphere in our rear view will eventually become a point while vega a point in our windshield will become the sphere you know or at least a disc in the sky and i think that in a sense you know earth let me say it this way when i look at jupiter i'm also looking at all of the jupiterians hmm. So when they look at Earth, they look at you and me and the squirrels and the trees and all the Earthlings, you know? When I look at Vega, I'm seeing all the vegans, um, or the vegans, pardon me. When they look at the sun, they see all the Jupiterians and Mercurians and Earthlings, including you and me and the birds and the trees and all that. You know, like the sun holds the codes of like the oversoul for our entire system. Mm -hmm. There's an older cosmology, which I dig. I'm not saying it's like real in 3D or whatever, but that what the stars are, are simply holes in the veil that shields us from the one and only light that is the all that ever was is and will be and that in here in matter you need such a veil or else if you are the light you'll just return to what you actually are and you can't have the earthly experience mm -hmm. right you can't come here in this place earth which we depict as the cross of matter inside the circle of spirit and we are on our way there um this place that has the appearance of time and space which is necessary for growth so why would the one thing incarnate anyway right it seems backwards <laughs> why would you ever disconnect from the from the gnosis that you are all that is was and ever will be right like at this point that's a theory or maybe you had a grand psychedelic experience or you've sat in meditation to the point where you've reached samadhi and are on your way to the rainbow body or whatever it may be or a near death happening you know um why would the one ever divide itself mm -hmm. and i think a good answer to that question first and foremost is it can't <laughs> because the one is essentially indivisible. So how the heck do we get here? And or why are we talking about this thing, which, you know, you can do in any language and they'll all be confusing. And the miracles that are tried to, uh, that, that the sacred scriptures or any of us try to express, I think one of the reasons why it said you're not supposed to speak about the mysteries is because you sound like a fool when you attempt to because there's something about this place where we're actually kind of encouraged to drink from the seas of forgetting so that we can have the incarnated experience. That's also, I feel at the heart or the root of a significant personal wound that we all awaken to on the mystical path of that disconnection. And that's the um, invitation then to reconnect and remember, right? But this image of the three things are the circle of spirit, the crescent of soul, and the cross of matter for me help me understand why we incarnate and literally how we incarnate. So part of that is how the moon reflects sunlight to earth, just as the myths tell us that Diana delivered Apollo's birth. Mm. Um, but what is the sun? You know, is it some nuclear furnace in space 93 million miles away like I learned in astronomy school? Or is it simply a hole in the heavens like all of the rest of the stars where the one only light shines through? Mm -hmm. And it's the big one because it's the one we're closest to. In other words, like here in earthly space, the sun is our local representative of the one 
mm -hmm. only thing that ever was, is, and will be, which I like to call spirit, where for me, soul is a very different thing. So time is real and it's ticking away. <laughs> and I have so much I'd like to show Martha, but is there anything you'd like to add to that flow before I move along? Uh, well, my mind was going down a road that probably I don't want to spend a lot of time on because it's it's a slight, of, slight bit of a tangent, but I'll just say it because it was on my mind, which is <clears throat> every day in my praying, I think I probably shared this with you when we talked a lot last summer, um, I get taken through our universe into the space of infinite universes and through that to what I am told is the quote unquote membrane of the space time continuum. And then I get like taken out of the membrane of the space time continuum. And then I am just in what I'm, what I hear is the void, right? Like this black, like nothing that mm -hmm. is the nothing and the everything. And then, and then, and then I, when I'm in that space, that's when I like things come through and I get message told what to do next or whatever it is but um so when you're thinking about when you're talking about that nothing place and that oneness place and then this the image of the stars being the the hole where the, the one light comes through i mean it's just i'm just reflecting on yeah why would we shoot why would this why would source if it's the nothing and the everything even create a time space continuum where absolutely time and space are real. <laughs> and one of the answers I am given, but I don't know if this is really the reality is that like that time space continuum is sort of a, a playground, like a dancing arena for source, you know, to just sort of. Yeah. I mean, I'll say it this way. Like the one thing spirit is all things and therefore it is inherently nothing. Yeah. And it can't grow because it's already everything. And yet it will never stop doing so because of miracles like you and you and you and you who are spirit reflected through soul into matter. Why? Because here in a place with the appearance of time and space, we can grow. And as you grow, you grow the all. Mm -hmm. um, I think that void, I mean, I wanted to speak to the idea of multiple universes it's, it itself is like hilarious because uni is it's just the all. Right. Mm -hmm. So all those multiple universes are actually within the universe or the monad or the all. I mean, I think the void itself is that point. What's the point? It's source. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not actually there. It's that great miracle that modern science needs for the Big Bang where they don't look at the singularity. Right. Like, don't look at the womb. Right. Because you know, the Big Bang is like one of the most patriarchal creation stories ever, because it's like everything ejaculated into being out of nothing. Right. And don't look at nothing like it breaks the rules, but obviously nothing has to be everything. Mm -hmm. So there's a beautiful thing you can do, like with a microscope where you're looking at something ordered and you get in and it's just chaos mm -hmm. and you go deeper and the chaos is ordered. And then you go deeper and it's chaos and it's like that all the way in and all the way out, you know? Yeah. So it sounds to me like in part of your journeys, you're accessing these like beautiful things where we connect all parts of the three. All right, so let's journey on. These are all just um, little bits from from my um, sacred geometry and other transmissions at the School of Earth Astrology, um, which in many ways is relying upon this sacred text. So I will rewind and repeat, "'Tis true without lying, certain and most true, that which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below to do the miracles of one only thing. Mm -hmm. And as all things have been, and arose from one through the mediation of one, so all things have their birth in this one thing by adaptation. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, some versions, you know, fix a thing when you can. Some versions write um, meditation here instead of mediation. And I think there's a beautiful thing here, right? So all things have been. We've heard that as there's nothing new under the sun and other sacred text transmissions. They arose from one through the meditation of one. What? 
But I think this is really important and it speaks to the um, truth of self-reflection, which is um, optional in the human experience, apparently, right? When you take a good look at yourself, uh, which is usually the result of a nightmare rather than a dream, right? What are you looking at and who's looking? Or if you've meditated to the point, like I get to like, oh, I'm supposed to stop my thoughts and I can't and I'm bad at this and uh, that's another thought. And oh my God, I'm thinking about that thought that I can't think, you know, and you, but eventually I'll cycle out mm -hmm. and it's like too much to deal with. And suddenly I snap out of that thing and I'm watching this being just like this maniac just creating in like a milky way or something, you know, and then I'm like, whoa, I'm doing it. And then it all ends. Mm. Or like who is looking at the maniac and who's the maniac? You know what I'm saying? Like that thing that is really this kind of inherent experience and why I love versions that say meditation here um, because I've had that experience in meditation, but also just in self-reflection or even self-critique, you know, like taking a good look at yourself, who are you looking at and who's doing the looking is a really important question. And it's a question of two-ness. But when the one becomes two, then three and four, as we shall see. So we also read here, um, all things have their birth in this one thing by adaptation. A good geometrical term would be translation. Um, and since I've corrected that word now on the slide from Isaac Newton's translation, um, this shift isn't going to look as cool. Well, all right, that did all right. So this is a place that gets a little heavy for many, especially in our day and age, because as soon as you start gendering things, right? So the sun is its father, the moon its mother. And many use that astrologically, right? Like many look at the sun as a representative of your father in the chart and the moon is your mother. Okay, what if you have two mothers, right? Well, did that happen biologically? Good questions. We're going to actually even advance scientifically to the place where the, you know, questions become even more difficult to tackle from an astrological perspective. And the whole sun is its father, moon is its mother from an astrological thing is not that rooted like you see it, it depends if you were born by day or night. Oftentimes it, you're looking at planets associated or in the fourth or the 10th houses. And there's so many ways to pet the cosmic cat. I wonder if that actually comes to us from these tablets of Hermes. Um, but if so, what about the wind hath carried it in its belly mm -hmm. and the earth its nurse? I mean, it sounds to me like here, this is a statement of four and probably the four elements with sun representing fire, moon, water, since she even more than sun pulls on our tides. Um, the wind being the air and the earth, you know, you guessed it, the earth. I'll just say that the tablet goes on from here to um, the father of all perfection in the whole world is here. Which I think we were just told means it's the sun is here. And its force is entire, if it be converted to earth, separate thou the earth and the fire sweetly and with great ingenuity. It rises to the heavens and again descends to the earth, achieving the force of things superior and inferior. By this means, the world was created. Um, and, you know, these words like superior and inferior, like we want to throw those out right away. They're astronomical terms that mean above and below. And, you know, we don't need them in synodic cycle study like you can say exterior and interior in some ways but we lose a lot of the cosmology of the ancient philosophy when we do so i'm really careful with kind of um canceling words for example and i think some of that's in this too so anyway i digress let's move on and think about the sun and the moon, and you hear this trip often, the sun king and the moon queen, and images like this are really popular in alchemic, alchemical transmission, like this ancient wood cut. Um, I almost said wood cock because of what she's pointing to, but that's going to take us in a very different direction. You know, there's something in the old alchemical recipes of like, bringing these two in the hero's gymos or the sacred marriage or sacred union right into the hermaphrodite which then births the child that said we are born of our mother once of spirit as many times and of self 
right? It's the divine rebirthing. So that's like this old alchemical kind of recipe to find oneness through two-ness or like forming and visiting the two-ness within to rebirth like the divine child, which is the new one, right? And I think that that recipe is very much challenged by a greater spectrum or this greater spectrum is offering an innovation to the rules of this old game maybe mm -hmm. and um yeah i'm really interested to witness how that will develop over time and it's been you know part of my um I don't know, a great journey just to ask folks <laughs> about this again and again and again. It used to be when you said things in like the spiritual community, it's like, hey, what is the divine feminine? You would get these like paragraphs. What is the sacred masculine? Usually you got this kind of shorter statement and it wasn't nearly as pretty. Um, and nowadays it's like, I don't know. Or if I do, I'm not willing to say, or, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting what's happening in our time. I think we're in a very unique and important place in time in this regard. Um, but I will say this thing about the alchemical tradition or the geometrical tradition. You see some interesting things here, okay? Within the world, you can see the grand square and the number four. You can see the grand trine and the number three, like you can see a lot of astrology there. You can see the seven planets, the traditional wanderers about with Mercury, the one who has the three parts of the philosophy above the heads of the not two here, right? And really importantly, the compass and the square. So images like this tend to invoke a lot of challenges for many independent researchers like myself especially when you put this letter in the midst, which some see as God or some the great geometer. Um, but really importantly, these are the two tools of the geometer. And the reason is one makes curves and the other makes lines. The square is actually not allowed in the rules of true sacred geometry. You have a compass which curves and you have a rule which draws lines and it wouldn't have those tick marks either because you don't measure things in sacred geometry practice, hmm. right? You have curves and you have lines. And again, the curves in a way are immeasurable, the lines not, um, the lines, sorry, are measurable and the curves are not. And that's like a huge piece of these different images of what I think of as the one and one V or one I right which is kind of better shown just as a line and they're in a sense two parts of the same thing in the geometry tradition i and i don't use these terms personally but i think they're good to bring in here the curve was seen as feminine and the line is masculine and i just prefer to think curvy and linear right or curves and lines which is why i said the curves and lines and the two parts of the grand design because they're very different beings and it's necessary for us to have both. Hmm. And there is something in between. OK, so this is an example I often use. I used to live in Seattle, which is exactly north of where I now sit in the Bay Area of California. Um, and, you know, the lines point of view, if I want to move from one to the other, it's called I-5. It's the closest thing we have to a line. And it's interesting interstate in that I that you see there too, right? Um, very different than the curvy I in my face where I have two. But, you know, like the shortest distance between two points is a straight line we learn in school. And if the point of like going from Seattle to San Francisco is about getting to San Francisco, then the line is your best friend. But if it's about like going to San Francisco and it's about the journey and not the destination, then we want to curve, right? So I found this online, which is somebody's journey from Seattle to San Francisco, a, a bike trip, <laughs> Bucky and his bike.net. Thank you, Bucky, where he chose the coast, you know, it's like a lot safer than I-5. You bring a sleeping bag, you get to see all sorts of sights. You actually miss Mount Shasta this way, which is a bit of a drag, but you see yeah. so many wonders along the way. And just a very kind of important example of lines and curves. And, you know, there are no lines on Earth. Mm -hmm. Earth is a very curvy being, 
which is a lot to say in and of itself. Like the only time we ever really see a line in the sky is in the moon, which is a very interesting truth, you know, because the moon is such a curvy being and we depict her shape with a crescent in our charts, you know? How do we see? The half the moon is that straight oh, edge. Oh, right, right, right. Find another straight edge in nature anywhere. Mm. All right, so that's part of what this compass and square thing is about and the curves and the lines which come together to give us power, a very modern glyph most of us are familiar with. Folks who are familiar with my work or students of the school will also have looked at this from kind of a transmission of a particular view of the sundial that's part of our path to create to learn natural time. Right, the bird's eye view of this thing, by the way, looks like the circumpunct mm -hmm. right so i can't really tell if that dot there is just a point but i might be looking at a line right in this circle right so let's play with this idea of circles as feminine and or curves as feminine and lines as masculine again it's not where i'm at with the thing but i think it's an intriguing study well how do i know that this circle is actually not just a line on its side do you see what i'm saying or how do i know that that line's not a circle yeah and so it really so much of this depends upon your perspective i imagine during your travels through the void and back right a lot of it can be like oh what if i look at that thing from that yeah place? it is mm -hmm. everything changes collapse? also what if you collapse time and space then all of a sudden this point this star that's over there and that star that's over there are collapsed together and then they have this instantaneous you know connection that that space didn't actually matter <laughs> right you know? so yeah. it's a wormhole and you know and interestingly worms are linear and circular too <laughs> it depends on your point of view all right this statement i sadly didn't quote this because it was in a different slide that didn't make this particular presentation but the absolute unity in becoming conscious of itself creates multiplicity or polarity. Um, this is a statement from the great John Anthony West and a wonderful text which I am reading from monthly for the school's sacred geometry and number magic transmissions. The text is called Serpent in the Sky, the mm -hmm. High Wisdom of Ancient Egypt by John Anthony West. And his transmission in a chapter called Pythagoras Rides Again is my favorite personal discourse on the quality of the numbers 1 through 12. Mm -hmm. It's crazy confusing, it always is. But I love this statement, the absolute unity in becoming conscious of itself creates multiplicity or polarity. Mm. One becomes two. <laughs> And I want to show that again, okay? So this is basically when the one takes a good look at itself. Now that's the great miracle that none could possibly explain, but this is how a crescent is born. I always had such a hard time drawing crescents until I understood that what a true crescent is geometrically, it is the engagement of two circles of the same radius. Mm. Now you can move two circles of the same radius so that they are centered on each other's edge and you get this beautiful shape, which is the vesica piscis, the fish's bladder, or the mandorla, the sacred almond, or the yoni, the portal. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if in this presentation I built in some of what I love to show in there of the human eye and whatnot, but I'm going to kind of start moving fast since I'm looking at the time um and see if we get there after that vesica is made i can put a circle of the same size on either of the two intersections to find this beautiful image um that many have seen as a foundation for you know, geometries like a so-called celtic knot i love the triangular or the curved triangle in the middle of this whole thing mm -hmm. you'll see in this image of threeness seven as well there's seven unique geometries. There's two pairs of three and then one unique one in the middle and the Trinity births the seven. Mm -hmm. But what I want you to see here is this intimate relationship between threeness and fourness. I can show four equilateral triangles within one. I can show four 
triangles in the square. Um, and we have this interesting thing in astrology of three modalities, cardinal, fixed, and mutable. Those are called the quadris quadruplicities because each has uh, a set of four signs or four triplicities, four sets of three, right? Or the grand trines, um, which are often seen these days as the elements, fire, earth, air, and water, right? And it's really the um, engagement of this three and four that births the zodiac. So four elements here and a triangle of threeness representing the cardinal fixed and mutable signs. And so here I'm showing cardinal earth. So what's cardinal earth, Martha? Uh, you mean? <laughs> what sign is cardinal and an earth sign? Oh, going through them, going through them. <laughs> uh, uh, Capricorn? <laughs> Thank you, sorry okay. to put you on the spot. I yeah. All right. So what's going to happen this here, like in a grand square and a grand trine, you can only have them aligned in one place. And what you'll see is like the next alignment's going to happen on the lower right. And it's going to be this dark circle that I'm using to describe fixed signs. And it's going to engage with the air element and fixed air is Aquarius. And then mutable water is Pisces and cardinal fire is Aries and fixed earth, Taurus, mutable air gemini cardinal water cancers leo virgo libra scorpio sagittarius and back to capricorn where we began though many would begin at aries and there's some interesting astronomical reasons for that but i digress this image of three fours or four threes is a very significant teaching in the zodiac and for how we get into three dimensions right or four so four we often depict as a square but really that's four on a plane and you can't incarnate onto that because you have some height <laughs> you know what i mean so really the image of fourness and the birth of three dimensions is shown here in the grand trine um, because that fourth point which i'm not going to find through that particular division of the triangle but like this Right, hard to show three dimensions on a plane. Sometimes that might be easier to see if I bring in like its partner. And this is a, a union of two tetrahedrons that's often called the Merkaba and shown as like the essence of the human energetic expression or perhaps that for all embodied beings. Really to get there, you need to speak about eight or even nine though. So I'm gonna get back to four which is actually depicted by three, by the trine. And I'm gonna hopefully find our way into why I'm showing all of this. So um, this is said to be the tetrahedron, which is one of the five platonic solids or Pythagorean solids or perhaps Egyptian solids that has, um, it's a triangular pyramid where each face is a equilateral triangle and it's based upon an equilateral triangle as well. And in the Pythagorean tradition, it was known as the fire element. So there's five of these platonic solids that were each associated with elements, including the aether. The hexahedron or the cube was associated with the element of earth, but not with planet earth, which is all of these things. And really the being is all things all are of ether. But the hexahedron and the cube, which is actually six sides and eight points, the tetrahedron's four and four respectively, um, is an image of super fixed, right? Like dense, or in some of the tradition, you would call that gross, right? Where the other one is the subtle. Hermes says this, separate thou the fire and the earth, the subtle from the gross, sweetly and with great ingenuity, or we'd say the volatile and the fixed. These are an, other ways to explore, you know, here it doesn't work so well to call that lines and curves. But in our adventure of kind of finding oneness through the two, looking at the fixed half versus the volatile half has always been part of the hermetic tradition. So, Sadly, I don't have these labeled, 
But that cross of matter inside the circle of spirit that we use to depict Earth at the top, that's also an alchemy known as the prima materia. And there's a good question of where does that come from? Like, are these other things being born of it or is it born of these other things? On the left at the top, the um, I depicted it here in the color black with the horizontal line, that's celestial salt, which is fixed form embodied. We're on the right, celestial nitre, right? So it's gonna be easier for the astrology student to kind of get down to the next level here where from the left to the right, we see the triangles that represent earth, the divided chalice, water, the undivided chalice, air, the divided blade, and fire, the undivided blade. And these are said to, in some senses, be born, that celestial salt can be separated to become earth and water, that celestial nitre can be separated to become air and fire. But part of the alchemical study, and I think this is very much at the root of where we are here, and everybody listening can do whatever you want to do with this, okay? Like, solve at coagula. Dissolve and coagulate, right? Break apart and put back together. And when you put something back together, you might get something different than what you had before you separated. In fact, you should if you're on a path of purification. Mm -hmm. So the water and the earth recombine to make salt. But the water and the air recombine to make mercury. Hmm. And the air and the fire recombine to make sulfur. Hmm. Okay, so that mercury isn't planet mercury, though. There's something about it. All right. These three things at the bottom, these are the three principles. Salt, mercury, and sulfur, which you can see as like body, mind, and spirit, or body, intelligence, and I don't mean brain when I say that word, and um, essence. So these three things are in plants, like the kind of body of the plant, the alcohol of the plant, and the essential oil of the plant, for example. They're in metals, they're in all things. They're a little bit more, they're a little bit less tangible than the four elements themselves, or from a different perspective, more. <laughs> but importantly, like when the one becomes two, then three and four, and oh wow, those were labeled. <laughs> um, I wanna get to this thing and then we will get out, right? So the four. Um, now, what is the three? What is the four? If the two, which I'll call the not two, really is spirit reflecting upon itself and a soul is born. And any time that happens, a new soul is born. And the expression, when one becomes two, then three and four, shows the necessity that each of these souls, which are unique reflections, and I mean entire reflections of the one and only thing spirit, they must manifest. So this is an example I always love to use. Um, I'm a saxophonist, and I cannot make what I call saxitone without a saxophone. Mm. And the saxophone cannot make saxitone without a saxophonist. Mm -hmm. The saxophone and the saxophonist are not two. The saxophone that they produce is not the three, it's the four. The three is the creative need, mm -hmm. the relationship between the two, which is inherently an oppositional force, right? Like for the sculptor, the stone is her enemy, <laughs> you know, and the opposite is quite true, especially when the chisel comes out, you know, but it's not that they are here to create this beautiful thing called statue, which is the four. Mm. The five is a whole different trip, okay? So I think I'm going to get to show this in a very different way. We emerge from source and that's the one, spirit. If spirit considers itself, and no one can explain this, this is the great miracle, a soul is born. You see that crescent of soul. And it's inherently a linear expansion. And I don't have to take it all the way out to this Vesica Piscis, okay? Um, when I do, this sacred shape is formed. And this line is the radius of each of these circles of the not two. So you can see this is the sun and the moon, which this miracle of the embodied experience in a place like Earth appear to be the same size in our sky 
why would the human eye here in matter we can see that spirit and soul are the same thing right like eclipses teach this mystery in sacred geometry you, you kind of get your first miracle which is a point and maybe you can emerge from there through a line or a circle which a circle in a sense is a spun line as we saw earlier um, but you can't just throw points around willy-nilly so once you get your two circles, whether we get fully out to this vesica piscis or any vesica, which is kind of the, oh, football is shaped between two intermingled circles, um, you have four points. You have the two centers. And so this is showing the line of centers, which is a representative of three, even better than three circles is. The three being the relationship between the not two. And then you have these two intersection points. And this is how matter is born. And also just kind of showing how when the one becomes two, then three, right? Because literally as one becomes two, the third thing is the relationship between. When one becomes two, then three and four. The soul, which is a reflection of the one and only thing spirit must incarnate into matter. So one of the ways that um, we find the final shape of the cross of matter, which we use in sacred geometry is to kind of tame this cross so that what we can perceive here is a horizontal and vertical, or you might even say the horizon and the meridian of a chart, you know, the angles. Um, this is the glyph we use for earth, the cross of matter inside the circle of spirit, because we're spiritual beings having an embodied experience. And another expression, I think of time and space right? Why? Because we are here to grow. How the four are seen here through healing, which really is a result of feeling. The latter feeling is kind of optional, but it's why the suit is equipped with a heart. Okay. So feeling opens healing, healing, knowing, knowing, growing, and our particular growth grows the whole thing. Now, if you tilt this whole shape on the side, you can see the human eye. But here I want you to see the crowning child emerging from the gateway of life. And this is the story of the sun spirit reflected through the moon soul to birth an incarnated being here on earth. In a place with the appearance of time and space so we can grow. Mm -hmm. We can connect these dots and find our way to a grand square. Um, or you might see that actually is a triangular based <laughs> triangular sided tetrahedron, the fire, and I can get there actually um, without drawing that image of the four, but by using just one of these intersection points and triangulating. You know, I could like throw a point anywhere after a triangle is happening, which is a plane to create three dimensions. But again, the rules of sacred geometry, you say I can't just drop points anywhere I want. Now you can do whatever you want, you know, but in sacred geometry, if I choose to play by those rules, I would work with that point that's also defined, which gives rise to this three dimensional thing. But we in um, here on earth, right like material beings witnessing the heavens um we are living in three dimensions of space but there's a fourth dimension of time this is kind of out of place but i call the sacred geometry work like our yoga at the launch pad mm -hmm. because we're drawing on pads um this is another the expression from this great text by John Anthony West, Serpent in the Sky. He calls this image of the inscribed square, a square inside inscribed by a circle, um, positive potential matter, matter contained within unity. And there's a lot to see there. It's also a template, by the way, to get to the mean orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Mm which many of these are transmitted in this wonderful text here shown a little book of coincidence in the solar system. 
So my students in the School of Astrology are invited to engage with these drawing practices and eventually it becomes very astronomical and very astrological, like the image of the pentacle that you see on the cover there is the way that Earth sees Venus and Sun, or actually in that case, the Sun sees Venus and Earth dance during the course of eight Earth years or 13 Venus years. And orbits are not circles, they are ellipses, why, which is why I have to say mean, and you know, maybe it's okay to say that about Mars, probably not. Um, I wouldn't so much about Venus, <laughs> but very similar geometrical um, creations bring us to these mean or average orbits of Mercury and Venus in respect to one another. So this amazing gift of geometry that relates, I don't know, the earthly experience with the rhythms and periodicities of the heavenly harmony. So I want to end, this is actually where I am in my school right now. I've just invited people to draw pentacles, um, which is a very interesting thing. The twos, the threes, the fours all divide into 12, right? The five does not. So we move more into what some call like, oh, minor aspect space and harmonic space. Um, it's often associated with creativity because of the Venus shapes in the sky, the so-called quintiles. But there's a really important thing about five and it brings us to the golden number of phi and phi, which is in the design of human being and all things here embodied on earth and probably in other planets as well. Um, Fiveness in the Pythagorean tradition was a number of love because they see it, and this is an interesting contemplation for those who to choose to take it as the first marriage of the of feminine, which is represented by even numbers like two, four, eight, etc., and the masculine, which is represented by odd numbers three, five, seven, etc. And neither one is the one; the one is all things. Mm -hmm. So two and three are the first time is five where these two beings can come together in that way. And that's like, you know, a lot of people today don't want to hear statements like that, which I can totally understand. I'm interested in how that can be preserved, but reframed and rephrased for our kind of expanding awareness. Yeah. Um, a thing I'll just say about this to end is to get back to the saxitone. That's the four. That's the noise. That's what's vibrating the medium or the statue, right? That's like noise. But the way that you're experiencing that statue, the way that makes you move, the way that you're hearing that saxitone, the way that brings you in or maybe pushes you away, depending on where you're coming from, right? The way that you personally dance to the noise called a Jupiter-Neptune conjunction. Mm -hmm. Right, which the great gift of our sacred science of astrology helps us understand how that like measurable thing, that astronomical thing in the heavens can bring us to correspondences or the quality of the heavenly happening so that we here on earth, right, can dance in rhythm <laughs> with the above, which we actually measure from below our feet, hence mm -hmm. earth astrology. Um, yeah, Martha, so I was hesitant in starting to get into sharing a bunch of pictures because I knew it would turn into this kind of monologue, but my guess is that this is going to express a lot of the um, transmissions that the symposium, right, like brings to ears out there um, visually. Anyway, yeah. that's my prayer that it will assist in that way. Absolutely. And do you have time for me to comment on one? Sure, absolutely. Because <laughs> you the you gave me an aha for a question I've been having for a long time, which actually I named right to you right before we started recording, which is that you know, I'm channeling these books called Goddesses Speak, God Speak, and Love Speaks. And they're a trio that essentially help us to remember ourselves as all of the above. And and when I prayed on why am I getting told to channel essentially these books on the polarities when I believe strongly that we are the one and this non-binary reality is true, et cetera. The answer that I am given is that 
like just exactly like you were saying, the one becomes the two, the two becomes the many, the many becomes the infinite. And sure, our ultimate reality is that we are the one and quote unquote, part of our purpose in being here is a remembrance of ourselves as the one, but part of the dance of remembering it. And one way to remember it is to go from the reality of the infinite to the many, to the two, back to the one. So, so I hear that answer, but I've been literally for uh, two years, I've been sitting with the question of, okay, but why did the one become the two <laughs> to begin with, you know? And so when you have that way of describing it, that the one, the instant, the one essentially reflects, or I can't remember the way, the wording exactly. That, how you know what you I say, when spirit reflects upon itself, a soul is born, but That's that doesn't answer the why. So I'll get back to that. I don't mean to interrupt you. No, yeah, but that, that right? But no. just the idea that we have, we named the, the one becoming the two, the two, we name the two as feminine and masculine. And I don't have an issue with that personally, but if I tune into that essence of the one becoming the two really being about source, in a sense, seeing itself or like the light bouncing back and forth between me and me, <laughs> you know, um, there's a purpose in that two-ness that, that anyway just shifted something really significant for me so what were you gonna say well there's one thing which is okay so if the one um if the one becomes the two because spirit reflects upon itself or takes a look at itself and so a soul is born into matter mm -hmm. um why it's <laughs> still a great question oh, yeah. and um an answer there is perhaps either it was just a coincidence um or there is intention behind this and again i would see that intention would be for the sake of growth mm -hmm. um you know i want to show a few more slides from the school i hesitate to go here because when you talk polarity it's very polarizing you know but yeah are these things feminine and masculine um i often use the terms diurnal and nocturnal um some look at these signs here shown is kind of gold aries gemini leo libra sagittarius aquarius which are the air and fire signs most will call those these days masculine um and I will think of them sometimes as diurnal, that's an old term, or even solar signs, uh, right? So the colors here are trying to depict that, uh, whereas the others maybe being the lunar signs or the nocturnal signs, um, Cancer, Taurus, Pisces, Capricorn, Scorpio, and Virgo. Um, and I like to see them as like in and out, and this is late in the presentation where I kind of develop this, but if I take that and like stretch it out on a line, you get the sine wave, mm. right? Oh, wow. And so this is like, the this conversation is always so polarizing. Um, it's my school is a little safer of a place to do this in a more public forum, but whatever, uh, we'll go here. I think it's interesting because it's a really challenging place to, you know, get into what are these things. And, um, you know, some of the terms that have been used over time can really just fall prey to feeling derogatory, right? So this is a little bit of an adventure into that, and I will end in another image of how the world is born. Okay, so above and below, right? Like, how does that make us feel, right? Or diurnal and nocturnal, I think a little safer, but what do you think about night and what do you think about day, hmm. right? This thing, especially if you use these older terms, like, like that's not going to be a pill that's easy to swallow right so this isn't me saying that but just to like assault the thing what if i said the masculine signs are superior and the feminine signs are inferior mm -hmm. right or i could change the colors here and this just becomes straight up racist right <laughs> or i can use these terms here's um something that's common today but it wasn't long ago where these signs were often called positive and negative mm. but negative sounds bad mm. and especially if you go oh look see the uh the masculine signs are positive and the feminine signs are negative like how's that gonna land for you not so good right and all this is just polar where is this third thing right i always love to show well if you've ever like wired an electric circuit 
Positive is not your friend. It will shock your ass to death, right? <laughs> Negative is your friend. Why? Literally because that black side of the circuit, as it's usually depicted in wire color, is grounded on a metal spike, earth, into the earth in her water currents, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is a way that's helped me kind of contemplate these old terms and not just throw them out because it sounds derogatory, especially when I connect them to places where maybe those connections weren't necessarily made, meant to be made. So this is a really cool thing that actually was born out of a question from a student, or I'd rather say a peer in my school, which is, well, why in the like ask axis or the signs of a polarity, how can they be the same charge? Like, shouldn't they attract? Because we often call like a horizon and a chart, the relationship axis of the me and the we, or the me and the other, which I think is alive in the symposium's journey as well, right? And I instantly had the answer, which is like, oh no, like if they were of opposite charge, the world and everything would instantaneously collapse. Mm -hmm. This offers not only expansion, it in fact demands expansion, which is what we want, Wow. But it will also show us like the mechanism of perpetual motion, mm -hmm. right? And this is like getting to the toroid or like the spiral that you mentioned before, right? So if we just look from Aries here and, and we use this charge model, which actually has a lot to offer, it's either going to move towards that negative of Pisces or negative of Taurus. If we just give it a nudge in one direction, it's going to spin forever. And this is like the perpetual free energy machine <laughs> called incarnating on a planet. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that might be also fun to share here in the end. I had decided very intentionally to take it out earlier, not only for the sake of time, because, yeah, again, anytime you speak polarity, right, you go into these really challenging places. So I honor you for not only your journey and what you're channeling in, uh, but also for creating a symposium to bring folks together to talk about these things. I'm going to say, you know, the next slide of that, I guess I'll share um, and I'll just read it to you. It's um, a lyric from Echoes by Roger Waters and Pink Floyd, which is strangers passing in the street by chances to separate glance is meet, and I am you and what I see is me. Awesome. Yeah. So thanks for letting me see me and you and hopefully you're seeing me, you and me and all of those things. I'm really happy to have been invited here, Martha. And um, yeah, may this do what it will for each and every being out there to remember what we really are. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'll just end by saying this Symposium is meant to be a conversation and an opening to lots of conversations. So, you know, when you're talking about those term that terminology, I do think that I I personally would love to hear from people who are listening to this. What other words are out there? What <laughs> what what is that that essence? How would you sum that up? You know, the essence of what is this? But here in my polarity homework assignment in the school, one of the questions was, how do you feel about these terms, masculine, feminine, these terms, positive, negative, whatever. I mean, obviously, these aren't like graded, right? So some of the questions are like, how many fire elements in this chart, etc. Right. Um, but then it was like, hey, what terms do you prefer? And there was a space to write in whatever. And I think a hundred ish people took that homework and like by far masculine and feminine was preferred by astrology students like that are within that particular school even though i'm saying more like nocturnal diurnal there's an issue with that though because you can never have the six so-called nocturnal signs above or below the horizon at once since the zodiac alternates between the two right i just like for me like night and day is a much more experiential things since I'm so astronomically inclined and I'm careful now with these words masculine and feminine and more confused about them than I ever was before mm -hmm. though I was ever not 
not confused too, you know? Anyway, if anybody wants to hear more about the School of Earth Astrology, you can find me at GeminiBrett.com. Brett has two T's, Gemini T's. Um, and I would love to invite you in. We started in January of 2022, and there's been three classes a month and some other bonus things. So you'd have some catching up to do, but um, if you are passionate about the starry science, you know, we also know you're probably an addict for learning like most of us are. Um, and so if that sounds fun to you, come on by. You can check it out at GeminiBrett.com. Thanks again, Martha. Um, what is time? Well, hopefully it's <laughs> not real because I think we went twice as long as we were meant to. So oh, good. my bad. I don't know. No, um, no, no. You're good. <laughs> right on. Well, I look forward to seeing many of these other um, transmissions and uh, I look forward to catching up with you again sometime soon. Thanks again. Absolutely. And I highly recommend you, highly recommend your work, highly recommend working one-on-one, -on -one, all of the above. Like, thank you so much. Mm, really, thank really you. All right. See you in space. Bye.